Today we gather to explore the life of one of Britain's most iconic and influential monarchs, Queen Victoria. Born in 1819, Victoria ascended the throne at the tender age of 18 and ruled for an impressive 63 years, ushering in an era of unprecedented industrial, cultural and scientific advancements. Her reign, aptly named the Victorian era, was a period of immense progress and global expansion, transforming the British Empire into a powerhouse that stretched across continents. A symbol of morality and family values, Queen Victoria was steadfast in her commitment to her people and her empire. She was the mother to nine children and grandmother to many more, weaving a web of relationships that spanned Europe's royal families. Notably, her marriage to Prince Albert of Saxe coburg and Gotha not only brought her great happiness, but also influenced the course of British history, as their shared passion for arts and sciences inspired a generation of innovation. Despite facing numerous challenges, both personal and political, Queen Victoria remained a resilient and dedicated leader. Her reign shaped the very essence of what it meant to be British and laid the foundation for the modern constitutional monarchy we know today. As we delve deeper into her life, we will uncover the triumphs, the heartaches and the enduring legacy of a woman who was truly a force to be reckoned with. It was 1817 and the British monarchy was in the throes of a succession crisis. King George III's only legitimate grandchild, the young and vibrant Princess Charlotte of Wales, had tragically passed away. Desperate to secure the realm's future, pressure mounted on the King's unmarried sons to marry and produce heirs. But in the year 1818, Prince Edward, bearing the title of Duke of Kent and Strathern and notably recognised as the fourth son of King George III, would eventually wed the alluring and widowed German princess, Victoria of saxe coburg salfeld This union brought the Duke a wife and two stepchildren, Carl and Fedora. Born of Victoria's first marriage to Emmett Carl, the second prince of Leiningen. On the 24th of May 1819, in the hallowed halls of Kensington Palace, the Duke and Duchess welcomed their first and only child. At 4.15am, a baby girl, destined to shape the future of the British monarchy, took her first breath. She was named Alexandrina Victoria, after her godparent, Tsar Alexander I of Russia, and her mother. The other names proposed by her parents were dropped at the behest of the Prince Regent, Kent's eldest brother. In a quiet and intimate ceremony on the 24th of June 1819, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Charles Manners Sutton, christened the infant princess in the cupola room of Kensington Palace. Upon her birth, Victoria was fifth in line for the throne, preceded by her father and George III's three eldest sons, George, the Prince Regent, Frederick, the Duke of York, and William, the Duke of Clarence. The complex web of succession only grew more tangled as time went on, Prince George and Prince Frederick were childless and estranged from their wives, making it impossible for them to produce legitimate heirs. But in a twist of fate, William and Edward married on the same day in 1818. Yet fate had another plan, as both of William's legitimate daughters perished in infancy. Victoria's father, the Duke of Kent, passed away in January 1820, when she was just one year old. A week later, her grandfather followed, and his eldest son ascended to the throne as George IV. With each passing day, the young princess Victoria inched closer to the crown, her destiny etched in the annals of the royal legacy. The years rolled on and the royal family faced many losses. Prince Frederick passed away in 1827 and George IV followed in 1830. The next surviving brother, William IV, ascended the throne, making young Victoria heir presumptive. The Regency Act of 1830 made provisions for Victoria's mother, the Duchess, to serve as regent if William IV passed away, while Victoria was still a minor. However, King William was sceptical of the Duchess's capabilities and openly declared his wish to live until Victoria turned 18, therefore avoiding a regency altogether. 
Victoria's childhood was far from idyllic. The protective nature of her mother and the iron grip of the so-called Kensington system devised by her mother and the domineering Sir John Conroy, rumoured to be the Duchess's lover, left the young princess isolated and sheltered from the outside world. This system sought to control every aspect of Victoria's life, keeping her weak and dependent on her mother and Conroy. Despite the Duchess's attempts to control her daughter's interactions, Victoria ventured on a series of trips across England and Wales between 1830 and 1835, and these visits were met with great enthusiasm from the public. On the other hand, Victoria found these trips taxing and longed for moments of respite. She was often compelled to continue the tours against her wishes and the King's approval as her mother in Conroy saw an opportunity to further their influence. In 1836, Victoria's maternal uncle, King Leopold of Belgium, endeavoured to arrange a marriage between her and Prince Albert, the son of his brother, Ernest I, Duke of saxe coburg and Gotha. Despite King William IV's disapproval of a match with the Coburg family, Victoria was introduced to Albert when her Coburg relatives visited in May 1836. From the moment they met, Victoria was captivated by Albert's charm and good looks. However, at the tender age of 17, she was not yet ready for marriage. While a formal engagement did not take place, it was assumed that in due course, their union would be inevitable. I never ever spent such an evening. My dearest Albert, his excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms, and we kissed each other again and again. His beauty, his sweetness and gentleness, really, how can I ever be thankful enough to have such a husband? To be called by names of tenderness I have never yet heard used to me before, was bliss beyond belief. This was truly the happiest day of my life. Throughout her teenage years, Victoria defied her mother in Conroy's relentless attempts to appoint him to her staff. As she grew older, her resistance to the manipulation only grew stronger. Upon ascending to the throne, Victoria banished Conroy from her presence, but he remained a part of her mother's household. During these turbulent years, the young princess held fast to the hope of a brighter future. With Albert by her side, she believed she could find the happiness and love missing from her life. But little did she know that her destiny was about to unfold, and a new chapter in the history of the British monarchy was about to begin. As Victoria celebrated her 18th birthday on the 24th of May 1837, the need for a regency vanished. Mere weeks later, on the 20th of June, King William IV passed away, leaving Victoria to ascend the throne as the Queen of the United Kingdom. Her initial days as Queen were rife with change. Her reign marked the end of Britain's shared monarchy with Hanover, as women were barred from succession under Salic law. While Victoria ruled the British Empire, her uncle Ernest Augustus, Duke of Cumberland, claimed the title of King of Hanover. In her new farm role, the young and politically inexperienced Queen found a guiding hand in the Whig Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne. Victoria saw him as a father figure and their bond grew strong. Her coronation held on the 28th of June 1838 drew a crowd of 400,000 spectators. As the first monarch to reside in Buckingham Palace, she would eventually pay off her father's debts, a testament to her financial prudence. And although Victoria began her reign as a beloved figure, her reputation hit when rumours of an illicit pregnancy involving Lady Flora Hastings and John Conroy a man Victoria despised reached the ears. The scandal ultimately led to Victoria being jeered at certain events. In 1839, she faced the bedchamber crisis when she refused Tory Prime Minister Robert Peel's attempt to replace her Whig ladies in waiting with Tories. This all meant Melbourne would return. Despite her status as Queen Victoria was still obliged to live with her mother, whose reliance on Conroy and the Kensington system had long been a point of contention. When Victoria finally proposed to Albert in October 1839, their love blossomed into a partnership that would see him replace Melbourne 
as the most influential figure in her life. After marriage in 1840, Victoria's relationship with her mother began to mend and the two gradually reconciled. However, the danger was never far away. In the early days of her marriage, an 18-year-old named Edward Oxford attempted to assassinate the Queen. His efforts were unsuccessful and he was later declared insane and committed to an asylum. But following this harrowing event, Victoria's popularity rebounded. The royal household was primarily managed by Victoria's childhood governess, Baroness Louise Lyson. Though Lyson had been a critical figure in Victoria's life, Albert found her to be incompetent and dangerous to their daughter's health. Following a fierce argument between the royal couple, Lyson was forced to retire, effectively ending the close relationship with the Queen. On a fateful day, May 1842, Queen Victoria narrowly escaped a further assassination attempt by John Francis while riding along the Mall in London. Undeterred, she returned the next day, using herself as bait to capture Francis in a daring act of courage. Despite the ongoing attempts on her life, the Queen remained resolute, even when she faced personal injury in 1850 at the hands of an unstable ex-army officer. Victoria's reign was characterised by threats to her life and a rapidly changing political landscape. The Whigs' defeat in 1841 general election led to the rise of Prime Minister Peel and the beginning of a new era. It was a time of great challenge. The Great Famine ravaged Ireland and Victoria was criticised for her lack of empathy. Yet the Queen's influence extended far beyond the British Isles. She played a pivotal role in improving relations between France and Britain fostering connections with the House of Orléans through multiple visits and hosting King Louis-Philippe I in 1844. This diplomacy would soon prove crucial during the tumultuous years of revolution and political upheaval that would soon follow. As the years passed, the Queen was at odds with her government. A strained relationship with Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston made governing increasingly difficult as he often acted without consulting her. The situation finally reached a breaking point in 1851, leading to Palmerston's removal from office. Through it all, Victoria's personal life was marked by both joy and sorrow. She and her beloved husband, Albert, welcomed nine children into the world, embracing new medical advances like chloroform to ease the pain of childbirth. However, the Queen also faced great emotional turmoil, possibly suffering from postnatal depression after several pregnancies. As the Crimean War raged on, Victoria's government faced internal strife, leading to the brief return of Prime Minister Palmerston. Tensions simmered between Britain and France, culminating in an assassination attempt on Napoleon III by a British-based Italian refugee. Yet even as political crises mounted, Victoria remained focused on her family, marrying her eldest daughter to Prince Frederick William of Prussia and watching her legacy grow the birth of her first grandchild. In this turbulent era, Queen Victoria faced personal and political trials, navigating the treacherous waters of international diplomacy and domestic strife. Yet the connections she established would significantly influence history, creating a lasting impact on the world she departed from. In the wake of her mother's death in March 1861, Queen Victoria was shattered to discover that her mother had loved her deeply. Consumed by grief, she blamed Conroy and Lyson for maliciously driving a wedge between them. To alleviate his wife's profound sorrow, Prince Albert assumed most of her duties despite battling chronic stomach issues. In August, the royal couple briefly visited their son, Albert Edward, near Dublin, only to be confronted with distressing rumours of his inappropriate conduct with an actress. By December, Albert's health had deteriorated rapidly, stricken with typhoid fever, and he passed away on the 14th, leaving Victoria utterly heartbroken. Convinced that their son's debauchery had led to Albert's untimely demise, she donned mourning black for the rest of her life, seldom appearing in public and gaining the moniker, the Widow of Windsor. The 
the monarchy's popularity waned as Victoria retreated from the public eye and the Republican movement gained traction. The Queen, however, persisted in her seclusion at Windsor Castle, Osborne House and Balmoral Castle. Her uncle Leopold urged her to venture into public view amid growing discontent, and she obliged by visiting Kensington's Royal Horticultural Society gardens and taking an open carriage ride through London. During the 1860s, Victoria grew increasingly reliant on her Scottish manservant John Brown. Gossip about their potentially romantic or even marital relationship circulated, with some referring to the Queen as Mrs Brown, and a portrait of the pair by Sir Edwin Henry Lancia only fueled the rumours. After Prime Minister Palmerston died in 1865, the Queen emerged from her seclusion to attend the state opening of Parliament in 1866. She supported the Reform Act of 1867, which significantly expanded the electorate, but opposed women's suffrage. Though charmed by Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, Victoria found his Liberal rival, William Ewart Gladstone, far less appealing. And in 1870, the establishment of the Third French Republic invigorated the British Republican movement again. It was now the Queen's health suffered as she developed a severe arm abscess which was treated with Joseph Lister's groundbreaking antiseptic, carbolic acid spray. Then in 1871, the Prince of Wales contracted typhoid fever. Haunted by the memory of her husband's death, Victoria feared for her son's life. But miraculously, he recovered, and their public appearances together dampened the growing Republican sentiment. Yet again, in a dramatic turn of events, a young man named Arthur O'Connor threatened Victoria with an unloaded pistol in February 1872, and her brave attendant John Brown subdued him, leading to a surge in the Queen's popularity. As her life continued to be marked by both triumph and tragedy, Victoria's reign persevered in the face of adversity. In the aftermath of the Indian Rebellion of 1857, the British East India Company ceded its governance over India, leading to its incorporation into the British Empire. Taking a balanced view of the conflict, Queen Victoria deplored the atrocities committed by both sides. Yet encouraged by Albert, she insisted that the proclamation of power transfer convey a message of benevolence, generosity and religious tolerance. The Queen's intervention guaranteed religious freedom in the Empire. General election of 1874 saw Disraeli return to power. He implemented the Public Worship Regulation Act of 1874, eliminating Catholic rituals from Anglican services, which Victoria staunchly supported. She also embraced her new title as of Empress of India as of the 1st of May 1876, and officially proclaimed at the Delhi Durbar on the 1st of January 1877. On the anniversary of Albert's death in 1878, Victoria faced another tragedy, and her daughter Alice succumbed to diphtheria. The Queen noted the eerie coincidence of the dates, and in 1879, she became a great-grandmother and lamented her 60th birthday. During the Russo-Turkish War, Victoria threatened to abdicate five times to persuade Disraeli to act against Russia. However, her threats did not alter the outcome of the conflict. As she endorsed Disraeli's expansionist foreign policy, Victoria believed the British Empire provided protection and civilization to native populations. Nevertheless, the Queen was deeply saddened when Disraeli lost the 1880 general election to Gladstone and mourned Disraeli's passing the following year. In 1882, a disgruntled poet, Roderick Maclean, took a shot at Victoria, only to be subdued by onlookers. The Queen was incensed when he was found not guilty because of insanity. Still, she was also touched by her subject's subsequent outpouring of loyalty. In 1883, Victoria suffered a fall that left her lame and plagued with rheumatism. And shortly after that, her close confidant, John Brown, passed away. Although she wrote a eulogistic biography of him, she revised against publication to avoid fueling rumours of a love affair. But the manuscript was ultimately destroyed but then Victoria later published a sequel to her earlier book, dedicating it to Brown. As her family continued to experience heartache, the Queen faced the death of her youngest son, Leopold. Initially, she opposed the marriage of her daughter Beatrice to Prince Henry of Battenberg, 
However, she eventually consented, providing the couple remained with her. Victoria rejoiced when Gladstone resigned in 1885, but his departure was short-lived. Despite her hatred towards him, she was forced to recall Gladstone, who unsuccessfully attempted to pass a bill granting Ireland home rule. In the subsequent election, Gladstone's party lost to Lord Salisbury's, marking another power shift during Victoria's tumultuous reign. In 1887, the British Empire jubilantly commemorated Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, celebrating the 50th anniversary of her accession to the throne. A lavish banquet was hosted inviting 50 kings and princes worldwide. Victoria partook in a grand procession the following day and attended a Thanksgiving service at Westminster Abbey. And by this time, her popularity had surged once more. Shortly after the Jubilee, Victoria appointed two Indian Muslims as waiters, one of whom, Abdul Karim, was quickly promoted to Munshi. He taught her Urdu and served as a clerk, much to the dismay of her family and staff. Yet despite accusations of espionage and deceit, Victoria defended Abdul, dismissing the allegations as mere racial prejudice, and he remained in her service until her death. In 1888, Victoria's eldest daughter became the Empress Consort of Germany. She was widowed three months later. Victoria's grandson, Wilhelm II, ascended to the German throne, disappointing her hopes for a liberal Germany, as Wilhelm held staunchly autocratic beliefs. Gladstone returned to power in 1892 general election at the age of 82. When Victoria objected to his choice of a cabinet minister, Gladstone acquiesced and did not appoint the controversial candidate. In 1894, Gladstone retired and Victoria appointed Lord Rosebery as Prime Minister without seeking Gladstone's counsel. Gladstone's government was weak and with Rosebery succeeding him, he remained in office for Victoria's reign. On the 23rd of September 1896, Victoria exceeded her grandfather George III's record becoming the longest reigning monarch in the history of Britain. She requested that any special festivities be postponed until her diamond jubilee in 1897. The jubilee transformed into a celebration of the British Empire at the suggestion of Colonel Secretary Joseph Chamberlain. All self-governing Dominion Prime Ministers were invited to London. At the same time, foreign heads of state, including her grandson Wilhelm II of Germany, were deliberately excluded. The Diamond Jubilee procession on the 22nd of June 1897 traversed a six-mile route through London, featuring troops from across the empire. The procession paused for an open-air Thanksgiving service outside St Paul's Cathedral. Victoria remained in her open carriage to avoid the arduous climb up the cathedral steps. The massive crowds witnessed the jubilant celebration and the 78-year-old Queen basked in the outpouring of affection from her subjects. Persisting in her travels throughout mainland Europe for leisure, Queen Victoria made history in 1889. She became the first sitting British monarch to step foot in Spain during a short visit. However, by April 1900, with the Boer War causing growing unpopularity in mainland Europe, her annual trip to France seemed ill-advised. Instead, Victoria journeyed to Ireland for the first time since 1861, acknowledging the contribution of the Irish regiments to the South African war effort. In July 1900, the Queen's heart ached again after losing her second son, Alfred. Oh God, my poor darling Affie has gone too, she lamented in her journal, describing the year as filled with nothing but sadness and horrors of one kind and another. As the new century began, Victoria observed a customary Christmas celebration at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, maintaining the tradition that she had followed throughout her years of widowhood. However, rheumatism rendered her disabled and cataracts clouded her vision. By January 1901, her health had deteriorated further. On the evening of the 22nd of January, at the age of 81, Queen Victoria passed away. Her eldest son, Albert Edward, succeeded her as Edward VII, with both he and his nephew, Wilhelm II, present at her deathbed.
1897, Victoria had detailed instructions for her funeral, requesting a military ceremony honouring her status as a soldier's daughter and head of the army. She chose white for her funeral attire instead of the traditional black. On the 25th of January, her body was carefully placed in the coffin, surrounded by mementos of her family, friends and servants. Clad in a white dress and her wedding veil, Victoria was interred next to Prince Albert in the Royal Mausoleum Frogmore at Windsor Great Park on the 2nd of February. Victoria's rule spanning 63 years and 7 months and 2 days established her as the longest reigning British monarch and the longest serving Queen Regnant in global history until her great-great-granddaughter Elizabeth II surpassed her on the 9th of September 2015. As the last monarch of Britain from the House of Hanover, her son Edward VII would belong to his father's house of saxe coburg and Gotha, marking a new era for the British monarchy. Queen Victoria was an avid writer penning an astounding average of 2,500 words daily during her adult life. From July 1832 until shortly before her demise, she maintained a meticulous journal spanning 122 volumes. Upon her death, her youngest daughter, Princess Beatrice, was named her literary executor. Beatrice took on the monumental task of transcribing and editing the diaries from Victoria's accession onward, ultimately burning the original volumes. Yet despite this loss, a significant portion of the journal still exists today, thanks to Beatrice's edited copy and Lord Isha's transcriptions of the books from 1832 to 1861, which he completed before Beatrice's destruction of the originals. Furthermore, Victoria's extensive correspondence has been preserved through publications edited by various historians and scholars. Physically, Victoria was not imposing. She was stout, unglamorous, and stood at a mere five feet tall, yet she masterfully crafted a grand and commanding image of herself. Though she faced periods of unpopularity during her early widowhood, she garnered widespread admiration in the latter part of her reign, as she embodied the empire as a sympathetic, matriarchal figure. It was only after the release of her diaries and letters that the full extent of her political influence became apparent to the public. As biographies of Victoria have evolved alongside the availability of primary materials, our understanding of her as a person has deepened. She was passionate, stubborn, honest and forthright. The establishment of a modern constitutional monarchy in Britain advanced throughout her reign. The balance of power shifted increasingly towards the House of Commons and the monarch's role became more symbolic than political, emphasising morality and family values. This transition contrasted starkly with the scandals that had plagued the House of Hanover, discrediting the monarchy. The establishment of the family monarchy resonated with the burgeoning middle classes, solidifying a relatable and respectable image for the British royals. Mm -hmm. 